of San Diego City Attorney. Mr. Goldsmith spent his first six years on the bench handling criminal and civil trials and his final years assigned to an independent civil cabinet. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Goldsmith served three terms in the California State Assembly representing the Northern San Diego City District stretching from Mira Mesa to the Escondido Board. During his career in the Assembly, he held various leadership positions, including Majority Floor Leader, Member of Rules Committee, Chairman of the Banking and Finance Committee, and Vice Chairman of Judiciary. Jan has taught at, as adjunct professor of law at three San Diego law schools on subjects including municipal government law and prosecution of political crimes. He also served as mayor of power. Mr. Goldsmith graduated magna cum laude from the University of San Diego in 1976. He is married to Christine, and they have three, three children, now ages 29, 26, and 21. Kindly give a warm welcome to City Attorney Jim Goldsmith. Thank you very much. Uh, they're now 31, 29, and 23. How about you? Uh, time so, goes yeah, time goes to go fly. And I have to tell you, 15 years ago, I, I recognize some of your faces. And of course, I've known Marty Judd for many years. Uh, some of you I, I don't recall, but it's been 15 years since I've represented the branch of the North Carolina State, State Assembly. And you know something? I really, I really miss this community. I, I love Branch Bernardo. I love my wife, my, my family and I lived in Poway for 20 years. I was a mayor of Poway, and I was the first Powegian mayor to ride in the Rancho Bernardo Parade. Uh, and some of you may remember back the years before I was mayor, there was, there was fights between Rancho Bernardo and Poway over the olive trees. Anybody remember that? I do, I do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, Poway was finally fighting with a lot of a lot of communities at the time, just feeling its oats and and uh, in fact we had the Treaty of Pomerado Road with the city of San Diego where we actually opened the road and ended lawsuits and all that. Those were the those were the years. Um, and uh, I miss this community, it's a very active community and uh, I I wish all communities were as 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 attuned. Uh, today I serve as the city attorney. Um, I kind of hung up my political spurs. Um, I have served in the state legislature and as a, a mayor, uh, but I, I don't consider myself political. I wouldn't have run for this office if it was a political, if I viewed it as a, a real political office. Ten years on the bench kind of squeezed that politician out of me. I am a lawyer. I, I love the law. And to me, this office was a challenge. Thank you. This office was a challenge. Um, in that practicing law in a fishbowl is, is a real challenge. I'll tell you about my, my, my office in a, in a moment, then talk about some issues, then open it up to things that are in your mind. But I specifically did not run for this office uh, to, to make policy. Um, like I said, I didn't want to be lobbied anymore. Uh, so there's some things I don't do in a city attorney's office. As a city attorney, I don't fix potholes, although I wish I knew how. I drive around with a bunch of stuff in my back hospital and put it out. But I'm not good at it, so I don't try that. I don't uh, get involved in policy. I only get involved in the law. Uh, there's enough legal issues with this client that you're just, you never, you don't have to get involved in policy. Um, and I, I try to keep it only to the law. Uh, we will get contacts from, from um, citizens on their individual land use issues, for example, and unless there's a legal issue, we don't get involved because it's not, it's not our job. And we stick to practicing law. When I first took office, um, I said, remember the way the office used to be? Anybody remember my correct section of the way it Well, I'll tell you about my first day and then I'll tell you a little bit about the office. The first day, there was junk all over the office. The office was really in, in shambles took over this office um, for a, a number of reasons. Uh, but one was just physical. 
boxes and paper strewn all over the place. It was disorganized. There was no office manager, no office administrator in, a, in, a, in a, one of the largest law firms in the city with 350 employees. You had to go to the city attorney to get the copy machine fixed. It was that kind of office, if any of you know what I mean. So he walked, and there was a whole bunch of junk, and my office is at the end of the, of the hall, and I finally get in there to see it. I took my oath of office, so I was going to see what it's like, and it was just all full of junk. So I, but there, somebody had, had received my mail and put it in a little box, which was really nice. So I opened it, the mail. First letter was from the Department of uh, Finance, the finance, finance folks for the city of San Diego. Welcome to the city uh, attorney's office, and congratulations, by the way, you, you owe a $1.3 million uh, fiscal deficit that you've got to make up. Uh, you've got to tell us that by Friday, how you're going to do that. Uh, so we have 1.3 million. The next letter was from the same folks, and they said, congratulations, welcome, two letters. I kind of figured, now, now I see why the city's had its fiscal problems. And, and, and it said, congratulations, all that work. We now need to know about your budget for next year, and we want that by Friday also. So that was really nice. The third letter was from a lawyer I've known for many years. It's a package. Congratulations. You know, I look forward to working with you. By the way, here's the summons and complaint. I'm assuming the city of San Diego. <laughs> and this is a true story. I went home that night, and I got a jury summons in the mail. <laughs> so that's the way it started. But it was an office that needed a lot of a lot of attention. And I won't go through all the gory details, other than to say there had been a 90% turnover um, in this office uh, before I took office. So a lot of new people, lack of supervision. Administration. And one of the reasons why I haven't been around the communities all that much, it's been a more than full-time job to bring this office back. And I'm very proud of our office. We have come back. We are, as I said, one of the largest law firms in the city. We have 137 lawyers. We had to cut that down a bit to make that $1.3 million uh, deficit. Uh, but um, we have 350 employees, 137 lawyers. We prosecute 40,000 criminal cases a year, all the misdemeanors in the city of San Diego and the city of Poway by contract. Uh, we also advise the city, all of its departments, the mayor, the council. Um, we provide legal advice, a lot of it you'll see on our website, uh, memorandums of law. Uh, we um, also defend the city and prosecute cases, uh, hundreds of lawsuits a year, some of them personal injury cases, some of them pension cases, some of them large uh, uh, fights over contracts. Um, you'll see our, our lawyers out in the community um, often on criminal matters because we have neighborhood, what we call neighborhood prosecutors. We spend a lot of time down, down in areas of very high crime uh, in trying to work out community solutions. Um, we, uh, we have instilled in our office uh, the type of, uh, of, of management that you'll see in a large civil law firm uh, we have team approach, we have training, supervision, we have quality control that was not in place. We call it a red file system. It also has pink files, green files, and blue files, depending upon what they are. But we, we offer guidance to our lawyers. Um, when I took office, we had to screen everyone to see who was political and who was not. We wanted lawyers, and we wanted people who wanted to work in a law firm, whether they be lawyers or paralegals. Um, it took us about six months to get our team together. And then we started implementing a, a strategy of rebuilding a quality law firm. Um, I believe we're at a position where we're a very good municipal law firm. And our goal is to be among the best. And we're, we're getting there. Uh, one of our lawyers, one of our litigators, was just uh, named one of the top California litigators. Uh, and that's private and public sector. Uh, our office has received three recent awards. Um, you may have read before I took office a lot of litigation involving pensions and labor unions. Um, we have not lost a case in the three years um, versus our labor unions and versus anything having to do with pensions. We have been successful because we are smart about the way we go about doing it. We pick our battles. We won a two cases last year that resulted in a settlement on retiree health that will uh, save the city over $700 million. Um, the legal issue is whether uh, there was a, a vested right, a constitutional and contractual right to keep retiree health benefits, or could we change them as a city? 
we won two big cases in which we, we, we prevailed that they could be changed. Then we sat down with the labor unions and we negotiated the changes and it was a give and take. But we didn't keep with the litigation for years and years. We won, we picked our battles, won our case, and then cashed in through the negotiated process. And that is the model I would prefer to go. Uh, it hasn't always worked that way. And we're still in litigation. But we, we view our role as, again, not political, but as lawyers. So the reason why we don't lose very many cases is that when we see that the city has done something wrong and we're going to lose, we learn that before the other side does, and we settle. That's what good lawyers do. Uh, when we go to trial, it's because we think we have a very good chance of winning. We're not afraid to play hardball with the biggest law firms in, in the country, and we have. And we're not afraid to negotiate and, and, um, and provide a good settlement where it's supposed to be done that way. Uh, we still make mistakes, but because of our quality control, we catch them before they become prejudicial to our city. Um, we advise our client. We have a good relationship with the city council. And I have a good relationship with the mayor's office. Uh, when they do something that is contrary to the law, we'll call them out on it. You are our role as watchdogs, not lap dogs, and not attack dogs. But our job is to keep them on the right side of the law and play preventative law. And that is keep them within the parameters. Our lawyers are empowered to raise their hand in the middle of the meeting and say, wait a second, don't go there. Let us take a look at that. We don't want our lawyers to sit in a council meeting or any other committee meeting, see something go by them, and think, oh, well, I'm not sure about that but be quiet because they don't want to rock the boat. It used to be that way in the office. Before Mike Aguirre, he was right. It used to be that way, where they'd sit there like a lump of lard, and bad things happen, including some of the pension problems that we're facing today were caused by lawyers sitting in a chair who didn't raise their hand and say, wait a second, I see some red flags come over that and give you legal advice. On the other hand, we don't make accusations without having evidence and having done our own. And before we make accusations, we try to get it correct. So that's, that's our role. Um, some of the issues I'm happy to discuss about some of the issues that are going on now, more so from a legal perspective, but we're going and we're talking about convention centers, we're talking about stadiums, we got a mayor all candidate, I'm the guy not running for mayor, I uh, don't want to be mayor, I already was a mayor, um, I want to be the lawyer. Uh, we've got pension lawsuits, and, you know, a big one just happened, and, and uh, Got some others. Uh, somebody said they wanted me to talk about marijuana dispensaries. Anybody interested in those? It's pretty simple. It's illegal under federal law. It's a federal crime to transport or uh, uh, sell or even possess marijuana. You go to federal prison, and, and if, it's, um, if it occurs on your property, you can lose your property. It's called asset forfeiture to the federal government. It's a pretty dangerous thing to play around with right now because the U.S. Attorney is prosecuting. Um, we, in our city, we don't have a zone for them to, to, to do business, so we've been closing them down. Uh, if the law ever changes, then we won't close them down. If the federal government legalizes it, the law could change, then we'll leave it alone. We enforce the law, we don't make the law. That's a pretty simple, pretty simple issue. And in fact, a lot of the issues we deal with are that simple. It's just a matter of the will to do it right. With that, let me open it up for any questions or comments. Yes. On the uh, pension ballot initiative, um, there was a challenge that I guess uh, last week the court said no reason to stop it at this point, but the challenge occurred after the fact. Um, so when you get to that point, there is a challenge. Is, is it your office's job to defend it? And do you have an opinion on it? Have you I'm happy to, yeah. With the, the issue has to do with the pension <coughs> initiative. Um, the pension initiative was put on the ballot by 116,000 people, registered voters, who signed it. Have any of you ever gone around trying to get a petition signed? Getting 20 signatures sometimes is hard. Can you imagine? 100, they actually got 145,000. 116,000 were uh, confirmed as registered voters. That's a lot. Under the California Constitution, we have a constitutional right to have an initiative. That was, a, and a lot of people don't realize that what we're talking about is a constitutional right. In 1911, a fellow named Hiram Johnson was elected governor on a populist platform. 
in his inaugural address in January 1911, he, he talked about the need for an initiative to bypass the legislature and go directly to the people. He called it a way to protect us from them. In October of 1911, the initiative was adopted by the voters of California, and it said in its preamble, this is the first power reserved to the people. In other words, there's no greater power reserved to the people in our state under the Constitution than the power of initiative. The power of initiative extends to local charter amendments, which this is. Once they get 116,000 signatures, which exceeds 15% of registered voters, those 116,000 people have a constitutional right to have that initiative placed on the ballot without the legislature of the city council messing with it. We don't, the city doesn't get to change it, doesn't get to say, no, nah, I'd rather not put it on the ballot. The labor unions, and there's a Sacramento agency that is their ally, are claiming for the first time ever in, in California history that before you get this on the ballot, forget about the 116,000 signatures, you got to negotiate with the labor unions. Why? Because the mayor supports it. The Constitution doesn't say you have the power of initiative except if a mayor supports it. Uh, it says you have. And I, I was describing this to a reporter this morning, and I said, I said to her, imagine if we passed a law in the city of San Diego that you can't write and publish your stories until you come to me and negotiate. What would you say? That's called a prior restraint on First Amendment. It's a violation of the Constitution. So labor unions want, instead of the 116,000, uh, that's only conditional upon negotiation of labor unions. I, that's wrong. I can't, can't allow that. And the judges see through that. And it's never been the law in the state of California. It is not the law. Um, we've had over 100 initiatives in the state, many of which are supported by governors, mayors. In fact, the, the governor right now is out proposing an initiative for a tax increase. That doesn't mean, it. and, and, and that doesn't mean it's illegal or anything like that. That's the way, that's a constitutional right. So um, they sought an injunction to remove it from the ballot. They actually want, if this is an issue, they want this to be put on the table. One side is a council, city council, majority of whom don't support this. On the other side is labor unions who don't support this. To go through this initiative and say, well, the cap on pay, I don't like that. Well, neither do I. Let's take that out. Let's take out the 401k. That's fine. Maybe they'll say, well, gee, we're entitled to pay increase. Why don't we put that in? They can't do that. It's not the, and, and so they're not going to get anywhere on that. We will defend our actions of putting this on the ballot, we being the city. I won't defend at this point or even give an opinion as to whether this initiative is legal. It's not my initiative. It's not the city's initiative. That's my whole point. It's 116,000 people. Now, there were our lawyers who were involved um, who drafted this. And they were hired by the proponents. And they're three individuals. They raised money and they have lawyers. Those are the lawyers who have to defend it at this point. And they did in a second case. And they were successful. We did not defend it. If it passes in June, then I have a different role. I'm now the lawyer for the city. And it's, this is the law in the city of San Diego. It used two ways to get a law. One is through the city council and the mayor. The other is through the people initiative. So this is as much of a law as any other law in the, in the city. And my job is to defend it. And at that point, we're going to have to research it. And hopefully it's defensible. I can't give you that opinion now. So that's our role. If it's defeated, we have nothing to do with it, obviously. At this point, the only thing we will defend is the city's role. The city has an obligation to put this on the ballot. It's going to be on the ballot. 116,000 people have their constitutional right. I'm, I've been in Sacramento, and I know the mentality in Sacramento. Uh, this, this state agency uh, comes from a place where labor unions dominate in Sacramento. It was when I was there, and it hasn't changed. And I, I'm really concerned that that attitude is seeping its way into the local level. They're doing things that, that are not appropriate, not legal. We should not be having a state agency come down here and disenfranchise 116,000 people. That's, that's inappropriate. Whether you support or oppose this initiative. There's two arguments, many arguments on this initiative. It's going to be debated, and you make your decision. 
But the one thing that's, that is uh, that we should all agree on is that 116,000 people have a constitutional right to have on the ballot. Any other questions? Or? Well, just yes. to follow up with that, the Public Employees Relations Board is supposed to make a decision to make. Uh, no, that's, you read too much newspapers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, you know, um, I don't know where you get accurate information nowadays. There's a lot of blogs, a lot of, no, they didn't make any decision. No, it's not a decision. It was a conference call uh, to see when they want to set a hearing. Uh, and they can set a hearing any day they want. No court is going to say that the constitutional right to an initiative is contingent upon negotiating with the union. It's just not going to happen. I have another question. Yes. Totally different subject. What's the latest on the Snapdragon Qualcomm issue? Well, you know, there's a situation where we we did have to hold somebody accountable. Um, the, the situation right now is that there was a void of contract in which those signs were put up. The city council, if they choose, could renegotiate what was done. They could say, no harm, no foul. Or they could take Qualcomm and go further and, 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 and hold accountable. Uh, they have plenty of time to decide that at some future point. They don't have an obligation to do that right away. But the bottom line is, um, does anybody know what happened? It really is not a, it's, it's not an earth shattering issue, but you know, we have a process in, in our city. Uh, we're a, a multi-billion dollar operation that's supposed to be transparent for the public. We are accountable to the public. You are the shareholders. I am a shareholder too, in addition to being the attorney. And so we have processes that try to protect against abuse and make sure everybody knows what's going on. Uh, all contracts have to be signed by my office. It's a nice thing to have because that gives us a chance to see what's going on and stop it if it's illegal. Um, in addition, there's some contracts, some contracts can be entered into just signed off by the mayor, but our office has to sign. Some contracts have to go to the city council. In this situation, Qualcomm wanted to change the name of Qualcomm Stadium and put up banners that said Snapdragon and new signs and all that. They had a contract, a signed contract, that allowed them to name it Qualcomm. Uh, it, the contract itself said, if you change it, change your name, you've got to go back to city council and get approval of, of an amendment. They didn't do that, just signed off with the mayor. We didn't sign off, never went to the city council. Uh, arguably, it also violated the sign ordinance uh, as a somewhat of a billboard type situation, arguably. Um, the mayor's position was that he did this for what he felt was the good of the community because Qualcomm was, was basically advertising a product. I'll accept his explanation, but that does not mean it's right. Our job is to make sure the process is followed. He, he was criticized, and I believe rightly so. But does that make him a bad mayor? No. Does that mean it's, it's, it's bad to have allowed Qualcomm to do it? Not necessarily, but it should have been done right. We have this process in place so that we don't have future problems like we've had in the past, the pension deals and, and other deals that were, um, that were done without, without public scrutiny. Um, I think the, the, the council's will is just, you know, we've made our point, let's move on. And I think that's, a, I think that's pretty legitimate. Um, let me just say that this mayor is, is, is a good man to work with. Um, we sometimes have to do our job, and we did it. Um, and we, we work very well together. Other questions, comments? Yes? I don't know if I'm stating it correctly, but there was an issue about increased costs to persons who were going to um, be using our hotels and the legitimacy of that increase. Yeah, there's a, there's a plan to finance the uh, extension of the convention center. And it's, it's kind of technical, and it's, it's going to go to court by design, because it has, to be, it, ha it has to go through what's called a validation lawsuit to make sure that it's valid. It's patterned after what was done in San Jose. Um, in San Jose, they, um, they adopted Proposition 13 requires two-thirds vote of the, of the voters. Uh, to uh, approve a tax increase. Okay, that's, we all know that. It's kind of our protection. 
in this situation, the, the financing plan, there's two-thirds vote of the hotel property owners, not the rest of us. And so it's just taking out a segment, and it says, we will agree, you know, two-thirds of the property owners who are where there's hotels would approve an increase in their property tax that would eventually be passed on to the hotel patrons. Uh, that's been done once before in San Jose. Uh, we can't stand behind it, and that it's legal. It's a little unclear under the law. We consulted with a lawyer in San Jose who did it, and he said, well, we were able to do it, but I'm not going to stand behind it either. It needs to be tested. So we've been clear that it needs to be tested, and our office has just been very clear. We can try it. We're not violating the law, as long as we're, we don't collect any taxes before we file this validation lawsuit, and leave it up to a judge to determine that. And, and there will be, if that's what you want to do, that's okay. Excuse me. Yes. Isn't it, it, it's a three to one, and isn't it weighted also in terms of the three three percent has a greater weight? Yeah, it's it's going to be weighted, um, and that's that's a little different than what they did in San Jose. So that there will be a higher tax, and this is a tax, by the way. There will be a higher tax on hotel properties that are closest closer to the convention center. The idea is the hotel owners want an expansion to the convention center so that they can attract more conventions. More conventions mean more hotel patrons. They're okay with it. And not all of them are okay with it, but a number of them are. As they're closer to the convention center, they're gonna get more business from the convention center. So the thinking is, they should pay a higher tax, and that's the way it's designed. The voting will still require two-thirds of the hotel property owners to approve it. If they approve it, it will go to a validation lawsuit, which will determine whether it complies with Proposition 13 before any taxes is, um, is collected. I'm okay with that. My client has a right to, to um, test the law, but not violate the law. Our condition on this is you don't collect any taxes, not one penny, until a judge says it's okay. And so that's okay. That's, and that's a policy decision for your your policymakers, do they want to test the law on this? The easier way is just go to all property owners and say, like Proposition 13 says on its face, everybody gets to vote. Now, yes. in the hotel in the city of San Diego. That's correct. So the Colorado, Colorado. Right, only the city of San Diego, because the city council can only act for the, I think they asked. They did. <laughs> I don't know if <laughs> they, got, they got very far. Nope. Uh, and so it, it is a tax increase. It's pretty creative, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to go collect taxes and get have the city sued and then have to give taxes back plus interest plus penalties plus attorney's fees. I'm not going to happen. It's too too heavy on that. Any we other try questions? to be careful. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Any questions from the audience? No. Well, we certainly appreciate the fact. Thank that you very much. I hope I wasn't too technical. <laughs>